stand aright. Let us listen to the Holy Gospel. Peace be with all. And with your spirit. A reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory be to Be attentive. The Lord told this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will put, pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Glory. Christ is amongst us. Yes, and always will be. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Slava Jesus Christ. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory be forever. Brothers and sisters, I did a little bit of research regarding anxiety in the preparation of this homily. I know that I'd heard it said many times that uh, as far as mental health is concerned, there are issues regarding anxiety and depression that are on the rise. And I discovered that there was a massive study done in 2020, this was the, at the height of the pandemic, you remember, uh, that uh, took place in 204 countries and territories during the time the pandemic was the worst. And these authors uh, discovered some very interesting things regarding anxiety and depression. Apparently, the anxiety disorder went up 25.6% worldwide during the pandemic, uh, and that uh, depressive disorder uh, increased by 27.6%. Depression prevalence increased 29.8% among women and 24% for men, and the anxiety prevalence increased 27.9% for women and 21.7% for men. All that to say, that the difficulties that we have faced and the uh, stresses and context of the world have caused us, brothers and sisters, to be quite anxious, quite anxious. And we see in the gospel today, whether it's spelled out in words or not, that this story is one of anxiety. The parable is one where this man is anxious about storing his goods He's got so much stuff, he doesn't know what to do with it, except store it. And ultimately, at the end of this parable, we see the tragedy that our Lord visits him and says, you have spent your entire life storing grain. And this last moment where you say, I've got lots, I can now eat and drink and be merry, uh, means nothing, because today your life is required of you. We see that the tragedy is that this man has collected this grain. That's what the, the context of his whole life was. He was a grain collector, and that was all. Well, it might surprise you also, brothers and sisters, to realize that some of the first psychologists were actually the desert fathers of our own tradition. The Eastern fathers of the Eastern Church in the deserts were men who went out in order to come closer to the Lord in a secluded place in the desert but we're really interested in taking a look at temptation and thoughts and patterns that either led people towards the Lord or away from the Lord. And this is what our parable is about today. If we could have rewound the gospel just, just a few verses uh, before, I always like to say, you know, I wish we could have started a few verses earlier, we would have seen the frame 
that this story resides in. And it is in a conversation with a man from the crowd who comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, tell my brother to give me half of the inheritance that's supposed to come to me. Right? That's what the context of this situation is. Our Lord is responding to an actual request, which is, my, my, uh, my brother's not giving me what's coming to me. Right? So our Lord says to him, who am I? Who made me judge over you or the divider of your property? But what he says second is even more important. He says this, Take heed and beware all covetousness, for a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Well, to covet something, brothers and sisters, to want something, you know, to find your joy and comfort and security and identity in that thing, is a thought. It's only a thought. Who is the Lord, right, to say your thoughts are on trial? Your thoughts are seen. Well, we couldn't expect that from anyone else except the Lord himself. And we see this continually throughout the Gospels. Why are you grumbling in your hearts, our Lord says. Our Lord says in the Sermon on the Mount, if you are angry with your brother, you have killed him. If you're lusting after a woman, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. It is no longer simply actions, but the battleground for people's souls goes through their very hearts and their very thoughts. That, brothers and sisters, is where we encounter the Lord, and it is where we are tempted and where our patterns of life lead us to. And you can see this with this man in the parable, too. He is dialoguing, that's the word in Greek, with his own, with his own heart. Soul, he addresses himself, soul, you have many things stored up for a long time, right? We see this conversation he's having with his own heart, with his own thoughts and his own thinking. And so our Lord calls us, brothers and sisters, to do battle, not just with our actions, but with our thoughts, in our hearts, in that place deep down inside where we are close to the Lord and where we are susceptible to temptation. Those desert fathers I mentioned had a special fancy Greek word for this, and it's logizmi. The logizmi are the eight evil thoughts that are mentioned in the writings of the fathers, and avarice or covetousness is definitely one of those things where you are so interested in money that you don't see the rest of the world. You don't see the whole point of money in the first place. I've mentioned to you before, brothers and sisters, about this incredible book, The Screwtape Letters. And I encourage you once again to read that book if you haven't read it yet. It's a great book to read over any of the fasting periods. And it is a book about a, a junior devil learning how to tempt people by his uncle, a senior devil, who is giving him his sort of paternal advice. So we've got screw tape, the senior devil, and we have Wormwood, the junior devil, learning how to be a tempter. And it's in letter format. So every, every chapter begins with, my dearest Wormwood. And then he kind of goes on to give this advice on how to be a good tempter. Well, here is one of the uh, ends of one of the letters that he says. You will say that these are very small sins, and doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. That means God in this case. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. It's terrifying, brothers and sisters, to think 
that our thoughts lead us in one of two directions, either towards the Lord or further away from the Lord. And so we are presented in this parable with three options. We can take a look at that grain. We can take a look at the abundance that that represents. It's, it's grain in our Lord's time, but it could be financial security in our time, however that is lived out. To look at that financial security and to consider three options with it. The first is the fool's way, the way of the man in the parable. And that is more, more, more. I just need more of it and I'll be happy. I just need more of it and I'll be happy, right? Until he gets to the end of his life and he realizes actually more was not better. In fact, it was a waste. That's the fool's way. <coughs> the second way, I think in some ways, is even more uh, depressing. And that is to stop hoping, to stop hoping, to look at it and to not bother recognizing what's behind those riches, what those riches are for. In other words, saying something along the lines of, yeah, I used to believe that it was possible to be a good person, to do the right thing, to come to the Lord our God. That stuff's for kids, you know? I grew up and I realized that, you know what? It's just not worth fighting for, or it's just an impossibility. So now I just keep my head down, and I try to be ignored by everyone and just do my own thing, right? How sad is it, brothers and sisters, when we stop hoping, because at the core of the Christian life is the hope of the world to come. You look at all the people who have done the most for this world, it's people that don't have their eyes on this world. It's people who are working for the kingdom to come that affect this world the most. You put your eyes here, you recognize very quickly, brothers and sisters, that without that hope, you've got nothing to work towards. The second is the disillusioned person who says, you know what, I'm just going to make ends meet and get by. And the third, brothers and sisters, is the Christian way forward. The Christian way forward is to recognize that in our hearts, in the center of our being, is a whole and that nothing fills that hole except the Lord. And all those things that might bring transitory pleasure, like having a lot of money, or graduating from that class that you were taking, or finishing that program that you were doing, or all those little things that you say, you know what, once I have this, once I've accomplished this, then I will be happy. All those things are just hints. They're just pointing towards a greater desire in you that can never be fulfilled in this world. Your ultimate goal, your ultimate desire is found not in this world, but in the world to come. And that is the proper context of looking at the grain that this man sees before him. My land has produced wondrously. How can I use this in the service of my greatest good my greatest desire, which is to be in communion with the Lord. If he had asked that question, brothers and sisters, it would have been a completely different story, wouldn't it? It would have been a completely different pair. So what does it mean for us, practically speaking? How is reading this gospel, how is it going to change our lives? Two things. Number one, seek God above all things. Our Lord says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He also says that you can't say, here heaven is, or there heaven is, right? Because the kingdom of God is within you. If you are striving, ultimate, with everything you have for the Lord, <coughs> these other things are going to fall into place. They're going to be there in the right context, in the right location, and at the right time. But we have to search for the Lord with our whole heart. And that doesn't mean searching for the things, by the way, that he gives us, like consolation, or comfort, or security, or identity, or any of these other things that it's very nice to have when the Lord provides. But we have to turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I want you 
straight up, not mixed with anything else. I want you on your own terms, and I want you to do with my life what you want to do with my life, and I'm, a, I'm along for the ride. That's what we have to be able to turn to the Lord and say. We need to search for the Lord with all of our hearts, without any strings attached. And by the way, brothers and sisters, this is the privileged location for that relationship and interchange. Because we give to the Lord all that we have in this liturgy, and He returns everything that we have given with so much more in the fact that He gives us His very self, His body and blood in the Most Holy Eucharist. That is what we are doing, doing in this liturgy. We are receiving the Lord on His terms. We are receiving what He has to give us. And the second thing we must do, brothers and sisters, practically speaking, from, these gosp from this Gospel, is to activate our hearts during the liturgy. How many prayers get away from us, get away from our thinking? How often do we pray for all of those who are held captive, for the sick and the suffering, without bringing to mind their names, or without seeing their faces in our hearts? How often do we breeze over the prayers for repentance and we don't call to mind our own sinfulness? We are meant, brothers and sisters, to love God with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our strength and our neighbor as ourself, and our mind as well. And that means that we have to activate our thinking, activate our hearts for all of these petitions throughout the liturgy. We are sitting on a treasure trove of incredible theology if we are willing, brothers and sisters, to receive it and to accept it in our hearts. Brothers and sisters, financial stability is good, but it's not good enough. Let us not identify our success with how thick our wallets are, or to give up hoping to encounter the Lord. But let us approach God on His terms, in the liturgy and in the Eucharist, with open minds and open hearts. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Slava Jesus Christ. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Glory be forever.